3D print Dilbert. While I'm sure most of us have heard about it, I first about, heard about 3D printing in 2009. It was an alien concept to me and wondered how you could print something in three dimensions. And there I was researching and trying to find out as much as possible how 3D printing works and what it could do. Three years later in 2012, a couple of friends and I pulled together, saved enough funds to buy our first 3D printer. Our excitement knew no bounds. And with that, we were able to begin to apply 3D printing to different aspects, especially of our work in aerospace. But then, just to step back, what exactly is 3D printing and how does it work? So we all know our typical everyday printers and you type up, you write up your article, or put, in, put up your designs on your PC. You plug it up to a printer and it translates those bits and bytes onto income paper and you have a hard copy. 3D printing works in a similar manner, only that you would have to now put up a 3D design using 3D modeling software. You plug it up to a 3D printer and then it prints that up for you, physical 3D model. And how does it do that? It works by building up layers, wafer thin layers, one at a time, layer upon layer consistently until it puts together that um, 3D model. And 3D printing essentially started out in the mid 80s when Charles Hall patented the first 3D uh, printer. And he started out with a process called uh, stereolithography. And over the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, a lot of research and development went into 3D printing techniques and development. With that, by the 2000s, when his patent expired, a lot of work had gone on and a lot of new techniques of 3D printing were developed. And that brought about um, 3D printing, 3D printer um, prices crashing down to as low as $2,000. Before then in the 80s, they were as pricey as $200 to $500,000. That restricted it to high-end industrial prototyping. But now we're coming to have printers as low as $2,000 or so even far below now, you could be able to afford to do so many things. And the different 3D printing techniques, while a lot have been developed, gives you access to 3D print with different materials. At the risk of turning this to an academic exercise, we'll just skip this bit, but just gives a little explanation of each of the uh, printing techniques. But looking at the application sectors, it's only limited by imagination. You could apply 3D printing to healthcare, to aviation, to aerospace, to manufacturing, whatever you could think it. If you could design it, you could basically 3D print it. You look at a few examples. In the area of healthcare, and what comes to mind easily um, 3D printing is uh, prosthetics. There's an example of prosthetics for people who have lost their limbs, be it upper limb, lower limb, easily 3D printing gives you a low cost and uh, a very short production time with functionality of limbs. But however, taking it further, what you could see where open bionics is now adding the functionality, connecting the limbs that they've printed with the nerve endings and giving you a model of thought so that your 3D printed limb can act at the speed of thought. And they've even made it look so cool that children are finding it very exciting. But still on healthcare, we'd find that 3D printing has pushed the bounds and fringes of um, tech in that that is a 3D printed heart, human heart, with all the ventricles and arteries and everything. This was done by a group of researchers at the Tel Aviv University in Israel. And right now they're making sure and you know, working the prototype to ensure that it functions fully as a heart. That's looking at solving the challenges to heart disease being one of the leading causes of death in the West, the United States, Europe, ETC. The other picture there is um, 
a 3D jaw, 3D printed jaw using titanium. And that was done as far back as 2012, fitted for a woman who had, you know, broken her, lost her jaw in an accident, unfortunately. Coming to the area of aerospace and transport, and given my background, this is one area I find really exciting. That right there is the SpaceX Dragon V2 um, shuttle. Right beside it is the Super Draco engines that were 3D printed, fitted onto that, and it has flown to space and come back successfully. <laughs> While this is exciting, and Elon Musk led that to do that in 2016, Currently, there are those who are trying to put him, at least give him a run for his money. Relativity Space is currently working to print the entire rocket, 3D printed, and make it reusable and fly to space and back. In terms of design, decoration, and manufacturing, essentially it's limited. Whatever you can imagine, you could 3D print. You could look at the intricate design of just simple everyday items that you could 3D print. And you could customize anything or whatever your products are for your clients. In architecture, of course, if they've printed rockets for going to space, a house is not too big. 3D printed houses already exist. This is an example of one in the Netherlands and the other one in Frankfurt, Germany. And this was done a few years ago. As we speak, there are so many more printed up in the US, in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. In the area of education, this is a jet engine. Students from the University of Glasgow wanting the model of a jet engine partnered with Rolls-Royce and designed this and 3D printed it, a functional 3D printed jet engine. Of course, it's not to be put up on any jet to fly, but at least for something to be functional within their labs that they could run their tests and understand what they're studying. In the area of robotics, again, a group of students from the University of Antwerp put together this very basic, very simple, and with everyday materials that we could find around us, using strings and motors and microcontroller, trying to get this humanoid hand to translate speech to sign language as a result of the difficulty of finding speech translators into sign language for the deaf community. So essentially, what we could do with 3D printing is boundless. And we got our first printer in 2012. Fast forward five years later, collaborating with the right team who were able to birth the Northeast Humanitarian Innovation Hub. This was launched in 2018, and of course, one of the first things I was sure to get was a 3D printer. And of course, given the insurgency we faced in this region, we know all that we've gone through this for at least a decade. Part of those who are victims of this are those who have also lost limbs, be it the military at the war front or be it victims from villages or societies around us. So our first recipient was Mohammed. Mohammed was part of a community of moving Borno, and Mohammed was a victim of the insurgents. He was tied up for so long and so hard that he lost entirely the use of one limb and the reduced functionality of the, of the second limb. At this point in time, when he got his 3D printed limb, he was just nine years old. And we got, instead of just having uh, that um, experts coming in to just 3D print, so 3D print these limbs and go, we got them to train 10 young people in Yola, where we are situated, to learn how to go about doing this. And they've gone on to print so many more. Beside Mohammed is Jafar, who was a local vigilante in his community. And of course, local hoodlums within the community had kidnapped a girl whom they went to rescue. One strike of a machete and off his arm was gone. And he also got 3D printed arm fitted. And there are numerous examples of pressures of ASP to bar and so much more. But Essentially, what we could do with 3D printing is limitless and boundless. It's technology that we can use and leverage to bounce back, bounce back better, and bounce back higher. Thank you.